Welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee, the fourth meeting of 2016. Please set any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please. I'd like to start with introductions. We are supported at the table by clerking and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office, and also welcome to observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch, and I'm the committee's convener, and members will now introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. Uh, good morning. Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. I'm Annabel Gould, the MSP for West of Scotland. Good morning, Christian Hard, the MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, good morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Drew Smith, member for Glasgow Region. The first agenda item today is a decision on taking business in private. You are asked to agree a paper on your review of the budget considerations at Agenda Item 4 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda Item 2. We are taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights on an affirmative instrument, namely the Equality Act 2010, Specific Duties, Scotland, Amendment Regulations 2016 Draft. This instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. Following this evidence taken, the Committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under Agenda Item 3. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his accompanying officials. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make any opening remarks, please? Thank you very much indeed, Convener. And can I introduce Eileen Flanagan from the Equalities Unit from the policy side and Stuart Fubister, who is a government solicitor and uh, advises us on legal matters. And uh, if required, uh, both of them are available to answer uh, questions as well. Uh, can I say I'm pleased to be here today to move the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duties Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 and to answer members' questions. I will keep these remarks brief to allow maximum time for questions and answers. Uh, these draft regulations propose to do two things. Firstly, to require listed public authorities to publish the gender composition of their boards and to produce succession plans to increase the diversity of their boards and to lower the threshold for listed public authorities to publish information on their gender pay gap and equal pay statements from those authorities with more than 150 employees to those with more than 20 employees. Our intention is that the new requirement to publish the gender composition of their board and produce diversity succession plans will give added impetus and drive to how public bodies think about and plan their board recruitment processes, including how they can bring, together, bring greater diversity to their board if that is what the evidence tells them is needed. We want our bodies to reflect Scotland's diversity to make the most of the talent that is out there in our communities. The lowering of the threshold for authorities to publish their gender pay gap and equal pay statements is intended to bring together a greater transparency and accountability in respect of pay. It is regrettable that 45 years after the Equal Pay Act, we continue to see women bringing equal pay cases to the Employment Tribunal. And while the full-time gender pay gap in Scotland narrowed last year to 7.3%, the gap remains persistent and significant. It more than doubles when you factor in part-time work. So we have plenty of work ahead and challenges still to overcome. But I believe that public bodies in Scotland have a central role to play in helping to pr promote equality and diversity and tackle inequality and discrimination. In fact, I would like to see a public sector in Scotland leading the way and setting a benchmark for others to aspire to. I believe they're up to that challenge and I hope the committee will approve the draft regulations to that effect. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, do members have any questions they would like to ask? Annabel? Okay. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just three pretty simple questions. First of all, how many additional listed authorities will now be brought under um, the provisions of the Equality Act? There will be 30 additional authorities. I will read out some of them to you. We will send you the full list and we can also send you a list of the uh, 20 or so uh, organisations that will not be covered because they will get fewer than 20 employees. But um, there is quite a number of uh, valuation joint boards uh, who will now come into uh, this legislation. Uh, others include the Accountant in Bankruptcy, a Cosford School, Creative Scotland, Donaldson School, 
East Park School, Fourth Estuary Transport Authority, Hermony School, Jordan Hill School, Lewes Castle College, uh, New Battle Abbey College, Orkney College, Royal Blind School, um, Bordnagallic, uh, South West of Scotland Transport Partnership, Stanmore House School, Taybridge Joint Board, the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, West Highland College is a, a sample. We will send you the full list. Okay, well, that's helpful. There's 13 total. Thank you very much indeed. And I know that during the consultation, some concerns were raised about data protection issues because of the smaller size now of some of the listed authorities. And I just wondered, Cabinet Secretary, how these concerns are going to be addressed. Well, the main concern was where should we set the lower number? And it's been set at 20, and that's on the advice of the Equality and Human Rights Commission because their advice was to go below 20, you're in danger then of basically de facto um, giving data protected information about employees uh, and putting it into the public domain. And therefore, we have uh, adhered to the advice of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. We actually, within the Scottish Government, have an organisation called Scottish. XZ, and that uh, basically keeps a day-to-day -day, uh, eye on making sure anything we do across government doesn't in any way endanger the data protection rights of any employee of the government or any of its agencies. And again, their advice uh, was sought in this, and um, the advice is to go below 20, you're endangering of uh, uh, crossing the um, data protection legislation. And finally, convener, if I may... For these smaller listed authorities, obviously there will now be an additional financial and administrative obligation. Has any attempt been made to quantify what that means for these smaller listed authorities? We've actually discussed it. We, before we actually decided to introduce this um, secondary legislation, we actually looked at whether there were other administrative ways of fulfilling this requirement without additional secondary legislation. For example, we looked at whether the public appointment system that we now have in Scotland was robust enough to provide this information without requiring additional secondary legislation. We came to the conclusion that actually we needed the additional secondary legislation and we have discussed it with the relevant bodies and the administ additional administrative cost is very, very marginal indeed and doesn't require any supplement to anyone's budget to be able to do it effectively. They really do have the information. It's simply a case of collating it uh, perhaps in a way they haven't done before. And that's, you know, in terms of the computer systems and their HR systems, is a bit of a one-off exercise because once you've set up the computers to collate the information, then it churns it out on a regular basis. So you don't anticipate them having to take on extra staff? No, not at all. Right. Not at thank all. you very much, Cabinet Secretary. OK, thank you. Christian? Just a brief question. I'm, I was looking at uh, as amendment and I say on, on new regulation 6A4, uh, 6A1, uh, the Scottish ministers must from time to time take steps to and a whole uh, 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 range of steps to take, which are quite uh, interesting. But I, is, it, is it the way we draft legislation usually must from time to time? <laughs> I find a, 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 a something I, I, I've got time to understand what means must from time to time. I'll bring Stuart in here, but I, I have to say, in 17 years in here, time to time appears on a regular basis. But on must both. before it's it absolutely seems very strange. And, and I think the answer is it gives you a degree of flexibility if you're too prescriptive. Uh, let's say you have to do it if it's said every three months, every six months, every 12 months, then you could create a, a bit of a bureaucratic um, nightmare in terms of uh, requiring things that are way over the top. Or indeed, you could be under-reporting if you're too prescriptive. So I think it's about leaving it to the judgment uh, of ministers as to when, in, uh, when the, these matters need to be reported on a regular basis. Uh, but it's a fairly standard piece of phraseology yes, used in legislation. Correct. Uh, uh, if it was silent, then uh, without any reference from to time, to time to time, then it might be suggested it was only a, 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 an obligation to do it once, but from time to time just produces the sense that they have to keep doing it over time, picking up this information, but without set time scales, as the Cabinet, cabinet Secretary says. Can you give us an in was the intention of the ministers just now, the Scottish ministers, to do it from, you know, what would be... Any idea when you will be uh, uh, well, I mean, steps? Once this is in force, then yeah. it's about doing it as quickly as possible. Um, but the idea is once, it's, once some information is picked up, it um, doesn't just stop there. You know, wait a bit, refresh the information. Yeah. 
so it's from time to time. And just to clarify timetables, um, everybody covered, the additional bodies covered, the 30 bodies, effectively this becomes operational from April 2017. Um, and therefore, uh, after that, we'll obviously be monitoring the situation to make sure that they are taking the necessary steps uh, to ensure uh, diversity in the succession plans and in terms of recruitment of new members and new employees and so on. Because um, some board members are also employees, obviously, in some cases, um, to make sure that um, they, in the recruitment processes they are uh, fulfilling the requirements of this legislation. Thank you. Um, can we, John Finney first, please? All yeah. oh, right, OK, uh, OK, it's supplementary, yes. OK. Annabelle. Cabinet Secretary, given the delightfully flexible nature of the draftsmanship, I suppose time to time can mean now and again when it comes up, the Minister's humph to do it. What I'd like to know is, whatever the phrasing is, what is the sanction if the Scottish Minister does not take steps to gather this information? Well, I think the Parliament then would then, be led by this committee, would take a very dim view of that and the Parliament no doubt would decide what to do in respect of the Minister failing to carry out their duties, as would be the normal case. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think we're including provisions. I can go to Berlin uh, if uh, I fail to carry out my duty. But there are other things short of Berlin uh, <laughs> that you can do to me. Thank you, John Finney, please. Thank you. We'll discuss these sanctions in private. I suspect, uh, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, it was my intention to ask you how many listed public authorities with less than 20 employees there were. But if, if, and I would still like to ask that, but can I supplement that? I can well understand that you, you seek advice from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, but people may well be surprised that there are data protection issues relating to what effectively are the salaries of public uh, officials. Um, would you hope that that would expand at some point in the future? To uh, We should be open and transparent about the expenditure of public money. Your salary, my salary are known to the public. I don't see why it should be an issue. The issue in under 20 is actually in relation to the um, uh, diversity <laughs> requirements. For example, it may well be that somebody doesn't want it to be known that they are disabled. Um, and if you go below 20, the advice of the Equality and Human Rights Commission is that then you're effectively, you could be effectively putting that information in the public domain and thereby betraying the uh, data protection rights of that individual. Sorry, I should have clarified. I'm, I'm really a couple of questions exclusively about pay, pay matters. I wouldn't right. see, yeah. clearly wish to, 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 to disadvantage anyone at all in that. Yeah. Way. So but in, in pay, relation to... Yeah, sorry, the pay, yeah. I mean, in terms of the pay, I mean, obviously, um, the pay, uh, if you're on a board, everybody knows what your pay is because we publish the information for every board member, uh, irrespective of uh, whether the chair, the vice chair or an ordinary member of the board, all of that information is already in the public domain. So, uh, are there, let me rephrase that then, um, and I, I may be slow in the pick-up here. Uh, are there public authorities where it isn't an individual isn't a board member but an employee? And if so, how many, are you able to say how many there are? Well, it, it varies across the board. I mean, and for example, if you take a body like Scottish Enterprise, which is already covered by the legislation, the chief executive of Scottish Enter Enterprise is automatically a member of the board. Um, if you look at the health boards in Scotland, the chief executive of the health board is automatically also made a member of the board. However, there are other organisations where the chief executive is not a member of the board. They would be in attendance at the board meeting, but they're not actually in law a member of the board. Now, in those cases, we would still publish the salary information of the chief executive, obviously. Um, so we're going to be as open as we possibly can. Um, and, and even if somebody is a senior manager, uh, very, the, the most senior manager, uh, they're uh, remuneration is still in the public domain, even if they're not actually also a board member. Okay, Th thanks very much for that. Uh, there's an aspiration uh, uh, among some people, myself included, that we address the issue of wage ratios uh, more, more publicly. And I think there can very obviously be a gender element to that. 
would you, you imagine that something that the public sector would address? Would you support that being addressed? In some I'm very empathetic. I mean, we had the, the report by Will Hutton, who suggested, I think, that uh, within, um, I think he actually suggested within private sector organisations as well, if I remember correctly, but certainly within the public sector, that no organisation should have a, a pay ratio in excess of the lowest paid ratio to the highest paid. I think it was 1 to 13 and certainly, you know, if you look actually at what we do pay, particularly given our commitment to the living wage, I actually cannot think of a case where, because uh, as a minister in every job I've been in, I've asked for this information, I, I cannot think of a case uh, where in Scot the Scottish Government or any of our organisations that we have a ratio of where the top paid person is getting 13 times more uh, than the lowest paid person. Okay, thanks very much indeed for that. And can I just say, it's, uh, to be absolutely exact, the number of organisations not covered by this legislation because they employ fewer than 20 is 17. And we'll, we'll send you that full list as well, John. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we move on to agenda item three, does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask? No? Okay. So, agenda item three calls for the committee to formally consider and recommend approval of the motion, namely... S4M-15553, that the Equal Opportunities Committee recommends that the Equality Act 2010, Specific Duties Scotland, Amendment Regulations 2016 draft be approved. I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move motion S4M-15553. I'm happy to formally move the motion, Convener. Thank you. Do any members have any other questions? No. The question is that motion S4M-1553 in the name of Alex Neil be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I thank the committee very much indeed once again? Thank you very thank much. You. That concludes the affirmative instrument. We will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament <laughs> and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his participation. Thank you. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 25th of February, and I will now suspend the meeting for the committee to move into private session. Thank you.